Blind Willie McTell was Georgia's greatest bluesman and is one of the most famous artists to come out of the pre-war era. He's one of the few East Coast bluesmen whose fame and influence rivals that of his Mississippi contemporaries like Robert Johnson and Son House. A lot of this comes from the fact that modern artists that you've probably heard of have been influenced by him and even covered his material. Another thing is that he was very well documented on record through the 60 some odd years that he was alive. We're going to take a look at his life and music and play a tune by him. He was born William Samuel McTeer around the turn of the 20th century. The most widely accepted date is May 5, 1898, though some researchers have put his birth in 1903. According to his wife, he was born in Jefferson County, Georgia, but what's much more certain is that he grew up near the small town of Thompson in McDuffie County. Born blind in one eye, he later lost vision in the other eye as a child. In 1911, absent his father, he and his mother Minnie relocated to Statesboro, Georgia. It was around this time that she taught him to play guitar, knowing that it would provide him with a way of supporting himself financially. At the time, music was one of the few ways that the blind could make money and it doesn't take much study of early blues to find that this was a popular route to take. The first country blues artist to achieve national popularity was Blind Lemon Jefferson in the mid-twenties. Willie's own style of blues was largely put on the map by the fast-handed guitar of Blind Blake and the style's most celebrated practitioner alongside Willie himself was Blind Boy Fuller. Willie attended schools for the blind in Georgia, New York, and Michigan where he learned braille and could even read the braille version of music. In December of 1920, his mother died and the career that she had set him up for began. He seems to have started off in carnivals and medicine shows, but eventually he would take the classic route of country bluesmen of the time, traveling a circuit of towns on his own. In 1931, he met Kate Williams as the two were performing at a Christmas show at her school. He took notice of her voice and invited her to record with him. The two were married in Aiken, South Carolina in 1934, and she would stay with him for the rest of his life. She often joined him on stage and appeared on some recordings, but music didn't become a full-time career for her. Kate found work as an army nurse at Fort Gordon near Augusta, Georgia. She stayed there while Willie traveled to perform and he would stop in occasionally to stay with her for a couple of weeks. Between Kate's nursing job and Willie's musical pursuits, the two made a decent living by the standards of the day. His most steady source of income, like most bluesmen of the time, was busking. Playing anywhere crowds and passers-by would be likely to tip. Tobacco markets, businesses, and movie theaters were all places that offered a busking opportunity. Willie's main town was Atlanta, as was the case for most other Georgia bluesmen of the time. Pre-war Atlanta had a thriving blues scene with artists like Peg Leg Howell, Barbecue Bob, and Willie's associate Curly Weaver. Willie frequented several long-gone locations of Atlanta's past, like the front of the 81 Theater and behind a building that later became the Blue Lantern Lounge. He played regularly at a legendary drive-in barbecue restaurant called the Pig and Whistle. He had an agreement with the owners where he would be paid a fee on top of earning tips entertaining customers in the parking lot. As an aside, the Pig and Whistle had locations in a few Georgia towns where people like James Brown, Little Richard, and Otis Redding worked as car hops. When not in Atlanta, he worked other Georgia towns like Macon, Savannah, and of course Augusta where his wife lived. Unlike most other bluesmen of the time who gave up music to find other work or simply gave up the ghost, Willie continued making money from the blues for most of his life. He could be found playing for tips in the street well into the 1950s. It was in Atlanta that he made his first recordings in 1927 for Victor Records. The next year, still working for Victor, he recorded his most famous and influential piece, The Statesboro Blues. The song has been covered by a long list of artists, with the Allman Brothers and Taj Mahal being the most noted. Other sides like Southern Can Is Mine and Lord Send Me An Angel were recorded by the White Stripes, who consider him a major influence. Willie recorded for a litany of record labels all the way up until 1950 using a different moniker for every label, probably for contractual reasons. Blind Willie, Blind Sammy, Hot Shot Willie, Pig and Whistle Red, and Georgia Bill were all names you could find him under. Aside from his commercial recordings, he was recorded for the Library of Congress by the famous folk music collector John Lomax in 1940 in an Atlanta hotel room. 
The Lomax recording also has him being interviewed. After then it comes the jazz blues, something like this. His final recording was made in 1956 by an Atlanta record store owner who gave him some corn liquor and captured him on a tape recorder. In 1957, in ill health and sensing that he was near the end of his life, he turned to religion. He spent the last two years of his life as a preacher only playing gospel music. He died of a stroke in Milledgeville, Georgia on August 19, 1959 and was buried alongside relatives at a small country church outside of Thompson. His original tombstone oddly read Eddie McTeer. Had he lived a few more years, he might have enjoyed the renewed success that other early blues artists saw during the 1960s blues revival. Little is left from his life outside of the numerous recordings that he cut. We visited the McDuffie County Museum in Thompson to have a look at the Blind Willie exhibit along with a potential guitar of his kept in the back storeroom. Willie is a bit of a local celebrity in Thompson and you can find tributes to him around town as well as an annual blues festival that carries his name. All right, we're here at the McDuffie County Museum. Uh, how are you doing there? Can you introduce yourself for me? Yes, I sure will. My name's Lewis Smith. I'm the director, the curator here at the McDuffie Museum. I live in Thompson, but I'm from Augusta originally. We have um, a thing we did called Scarecrow for the city and uh, it was an exhibit everybody made around town and yeah. we won first place with this blind Willie here and you can see it's taken right from his uh, oil painting there and the cover of one of his 33 uh, albums right here uh -oh. that he did in 1940 and then there's an article in Georgia Backroads about him with the same picture and there's another one the last session right there now, these aren't CDs or anything, those are albums, vinyl, vinyl records. They're real expensive and, oh, and yeah. rare. And then here, you have a bunch of Blind Willie uh, posters from the festival. And that one on the top left, I don't know if you know uh, the Penley fella who uh, is in Atlanta. He's a, yeah, he's a great artist. He did that one for us. And uh, then we have these, these others up here. So each year, uh, we have the Blind Willie Festival and uh, have a great time. When does that come around usually in the year? That's in May and okay. it is advertised in the newspapers and on the radio. Okay. But we have a great crowd, have a lot of fun. Usually the weather's nice. We have like five or six different acts and they're from all over the country. Yeah. So they're really nice. Like to make it out there one day. Yes, it's, it's a great time. Um, we have the D Dying Crap Shooters Blues by David Fulmer here. This is uh, one of the songs Bob Dylan had that wrote this song, and it mentions yeah. Blind Willie in it. And this book uh, is about Blind Willie. Another book here for people who want to thumb through them, uh, and I've sold some of these at the Blind Willie Festival, is Hand Me Down My Traveling Shoes by Michael Gray. He, he came from England, and he stood right over here in front of the vault and talked to us one night and read um, a couple of chapters out of his book. Okay, yeah, I saw about that when I was researching for this. Yeah, you did? Yeah. The talk he did here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, and it was fun. We enjoyed it. A lot of folks here didn't like it too much because he kind of made fun of the town. <laughs> and, you know, he, he the bus driver, the Greyhound bus driver from Atlanta said, where you want to get off? He said, Thompson, Georgia. And the guy said, why? You know, so <laughs> it made a lot of people laugh. This is Blind Willie's actual tombstone, his original. It says Eddie McTeer, but that was his daddy's name. And it says 1898, obviously that's not his birth date. He was 1901, uh, and he, uh, his cousin called him after Blind Willie died. And this is what came, but we know this is Blind Willie's. I've seen it at Jones Grove Baptist Church before it was replaced. And Rutha, his wife, mentions it in the book that that's Blind Willie's tombstone. So uh, the producer, David Fulmer, uh, did a video on Blind Willie, and he, he wrote that book. But he thought that Blind Willie deserved a better tombstone than that. So yeah. he got a blue marble tombstone at his own expense, and he had it put down just exactly right. And he went to Jones Grove Baptist. He took this tombstone up, and they put the new one in its place. And then when he got through, one of the deacons of the church went to behind the little a one room church and came back with a sledgehammer. And David Fulmer said, what are you, you going to do? 
And the guy said, well, we're going to knock this up and make gravel for the driveway. And Fulman <laughs> said, no, you're not. He said, i tell you what, I'm going to trade you. Uh -huh. You give me this old one here, and I'll give you this new one. Yeah. Call it even. And that's, that's what happened. Okay. So then David Fulmer had it in Atlanta for 10 years, and he, he was moving. He called us one day. He said, look, I was going to give this to the Georgia Museum of Music Hall of Fame. But I hear they're having financial problems. Would y'all like to have it? And so my wife and I went up the next day oh, and okay. picked it up at David's house. Yeah, definitely. So, you got to pick that up. Yeah. yeah. But I believe this is the only thing left that has anything real connection with the physical blind Willie. Uh, I called uh, an attorney named Pilcher in Renz, who handled the estate of blind Willie. And the only thing that he had uh, of personal effects was a little shoebox that had about three pencil stubs and a couple of wrappers in there. Yeah. And Blind Willie's grandson asked for that uh, about five or six years ago, and the attorney gave it to him. But no, no original guitars they know of that are floating around? No, I have one in the back that came yeah. from the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, Cause Happy Valley is between here and going to Wrens. Okay. And that's uh, also where the church was where he's buried. And the house burned down, and the yeah. guy that was the next door neighbor went in there after the fire and all, and tried to find what he could, could but it had burned yeah. completely to the ground. But fortunately, somebody had this one guitar that they said might be Blind Willie's. Yeah. But why don't we look at it in okay. the vault, and you you tell me what you think? Yeah. Okay. All right. We got the uh, possibly Blind Willie Mattel guitar right here, and uh, this is probably not. It's a Yamaha from the late '60s, early '70s. So he you know, he was dead by then. McTell was one of the greatest examples of the often overlooked Piedmont blues style. Piedmont artists hailed from an area wrapping around the southern Appalachian Mountains from Virginia to Alabama. This style of blues was more upbeat and influenced by ragtime than its Delta cousin. Piedmont blues is characterized by finger style guitar where the thumb plays an alternating pattern to provide rhythm and the forefinger adds embellishments. Early in his career, Willie chose to start using a 12-string guitar. The 12 string is a bit unwieldy but provides good projection and musical nuances that can't be had on a 6 string. His often wordy lyrical lines are sung in a high pitched voice that sets him apart from his contemporaries. Here we'll do a rendition of Statesboro Blues. Oh, 
grandpa had them too. I hope you've enjoyed this look at Blind Willie McTell and are encouraged to further explore his music and legacy. If you enjoy the content on this channel, please consider tipping via PayPal or Patreon, link below, and please like, subscribe, and share.